kill all zombies. It's October! I would scream. I'm very excited, but I cannot outwardly show all my excitement because there's something going on with my throat. That is why I'm a little late to October. Sorry about that. I've been dealing with weird health things for the last three weeks or so, which was all of the time I had cleared for myself to do October videos. Of course! There's a lot going on where it's hard for me to use my arms. We've been in a lot of pain lately, and the last week especially, really bad, has been a thing with my throat where it feels swollen when I talk, which is the best time for it to feel swollen. So the louder I talk and the lower I talk, the more I feel it. I've been to docs. I'm seeing more docs. I'm trying to figure it out. But I also really want to put out Halloween content because obviously it's my time of the year. And for the last six years, I have done big things for Halloween on YouTube. So I feel like I can't not do anything for October. Of course, the videos that I planned for this Halloween, because you probably know I usually have a theme for the month, were all very talking heavy videos. So that's great. And I might have to give up the theme for the month. I'm hoping I can even just get out a couple videos this month to be completely honest with you. <sighs> what a fun way to start off the month. I'm sorry. But if there was ever a year to have Halloween kind of suck for me, I guess it would be 2020. Seems right on target. So I'm doing my best. And thank you for understanding. This is a very stressful time of the year for me and I know my stress is making all of my physical symptoms worse. So I, I'm trying. If you are new here, that intro is way longer than you cared about and I'm sorry but I had to speak to my zombies. You are now a zombie. Even if you're new, welcome, congrats, hit subscribe. Hit the bell because the subscribe button means nothing anymore unless you hit the bell. And the bell means nothing anymore unless you turn on all notifications and then you go into your phone settings and you allow notifications from YouTube. The subscribe button was so much simpler, but here we are. What I wanted to do this month was I wanted to basically ghost hunt to all of the places I would never be able to ghost hunt anyway. Because of the pandemic, I don't feel like it is safe to do ghost hunting the way we've done it in the last two years as much as I would love to. I absolutely love doing it and it is heartbreaking. Although considering how sick I am, I guess it worked out for the best. So instead I figure why don't I do what I would do if I could ghost hunt to places that I know I'll never be able to ghost hunt to where I basically tell you the history, look into things, except I don't get to go. It's like the quarantined version of ghost hunting. You get what I'm saying? The only difference this year is that probably nothing spooky is gonna happen except for everything that comes along with 2020, which honestly I think is enough for all of us. I can't wait for 2021. Anyway, I, the intro is still happening, I'm sorry. And if you're thinking what I'm thinking, ghost hunting plus spooky history minus hunting ghosts basically equals me doing the armchair detective series. Name pending. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about spooky places. And we're starting off today with the one hotel I will never go to, the Cecil Hotel. So I wanted to try something different for this episode of Armchair Detective. If you've missed prior ones, the first one is on LRADS and sound torture devices. And the last one was on Denver International Airport, which sounds boring, but I promise it's not. Go watch it. A lot of you didn't. Yeah, I'm looking at you. I know you didn't watch. I can see who watches them. Did you know that? wanted to try something a little bit different this time because I think a lot of the fun is researching the actual thing or place and I wanted to see if maybe you guys would enjoy researching things with me. It's going to be edited so that it feels the same except that I'll be able to talk out how I get from one point to another. That doesn't sound very fun but in my head it sounded like a great idea for a video so I don't know. Let me know if you prefer this way or me having it pre-prepared ahead of time. But before we get into all of that let me tell you about today's sponsor. Very very appropriate to kick off the Halloween month, hunt a killer. Well, let me tell you about them. Let me start by saying I am so excited Hunt a Killer wanted to work with me because I have been so into what they do and I know this will be right up the alley of all you spooky zombies. Hunt a Killer is a horror subscription game that sends you boxes full of realistic evidence like maps, police reports, journals, etc. to create a chilling, hands-on experience. You basically get to live out being the character of a horror movie from the safety of your own couch and play a very literal game of Armchair Detective. Their new season exists in the Blair Witch universe, which is perfect for all Halloween and horror movie lovers. 
It's basically all my favorite worlds colliding and I've been an absolute geek over these boxes. Ask Anthony and Peter. I love detective type horror games. It's actually a new hobby that we've picked up because of needing to stay home during the pandemic, and Hunt a Killer has been my absolute escape when my brain and eyes are tired from screens, but I still want to have an immersive horror experience. I am so certain if any of this sounds like you, you will love Hunt a Killer. So, for a little Halloween treat, go to huntakiller.com slash glam and gore, and use code GLAM for 20% off your first box. Again, make sure to use code GLAM for a 20% discount. And good luck surviving the curse of the Blair Witch. <laughs> and we're back! The Cecil Hotel. Where to begin? I just want to learn about it, and I just want you to watch me learn about it so we can talk about it together. Talk about it in the comments. Just do it. Get down there. Let me start off by talking to you about why I will not be ever going to the Cecil Hotel. One, by the way, my hands are like, do you see my nails? I promise it's not that I'm filthy. I am still washing my hands incessantly thanks to the virus. But I dyed this week myself. And when I washed all the black dye out, it decided to just stay on my nails forever. So that's what that is. It's a part of me now. Anyway, one, I've always wanted to go here. It's not even far from me. It's in LA, but it scares me. Like the reviews have been really, really bad. Kind of sketch. It's not in a great part of town. It's like shared rooms, which really freaks me out. And I, I wouldn't want to bring like all my camera gear in a place where I'm sharing a room with strangers. So even in the past years that I've done ghost hunting, I have definitely thought of the Cecil because I would have liked to maybe grow the courage to go, but ultimately it's just too scary. But also too, it is no longer the Cecil. They rebranded it to the Stay On Main Hotel and we'll get into why in a little bit. And beyond that, not only is it not the Cecil anymore, it's it's shut down. It's being renovated and turned into a half living space, half still lodging hotel type place. I don't know if it's still gonna be shared rooms, but they're renovating like the whole thing. They're closed for multiple years. I think the timeline is like two or three years. They're in the middle of that right now. So even when it is fully done, it's not gonna be the same. You know, like it'll be the building, but it's not gonna be the same. Maybe you can talk me into going to the new version of the Cecil eventually in time, but I don't know, it's not looking likely. So it was a perfect candidate for this episode. Oh, look at that. People also ask how many murders happened at the Cecil Hotel. Exactly. So I'm gonna start with a very general inquiry to get a rough gist of what is happening at the Cecil Hotel. Warning, there's going to be sensitive content in this video. Real life, not fun things. It's a dark place, so if that freaks you out, I'll catch you some other time. I love you so much. Like I said, the Cecil Hotel is in Los Angeles. It's also called Hotel Cecil and The Cecil. Also now, like I said, stay on Main. And I think they're changing the name after the renovation's done. Wikipedia is always 1000% factually accurate. So, you know, if I say something wrong, take it up with Wikipedia. So I already know a lot of the background knowledge, but Built in 1924, I think it said opened in 1927, yes. And within a few years of it opening, the Great Depression happened, which, you know, naturally is bad for all business. It's talking about how in the 1940s, I guess the area started to change because of Skid Row, which is a place where there's a very high homeless population in Los Angeles. That's a whole other issue, but LA has a pretty bad homeless problem and the Cecil is very close to that, but downtown in general just has a lot of crime. It is one of the highest crime areas in all of LA. Yeah, this says as many as 10,000 homeless people lived within a four mile radius. Nothing wrong with homeless people, obviously. I don't think that homeless equals synonymous with crime, but I guess that's what it's attributing to the decline in the homeless. Hotel. In 2014, the hotel was bought by a new person who acquired a 99 year ground lease on the property. I didn't know you could lease something for 99 years. Why don't you just buy it at that point? Is that different? Peter, do you know? They gotta give it back to the ghost after that. Oh, is it because it's bought by a development firm? I don't understand. No, they give it back to say. Matt Barron, president of the development firm that bought it, said that he was committed to the preservation of architecturally or historically significant components such as the hotel's grand lobby, but they're changing everything else in the interior and fix the hodgepodge work that had been done in more recent years. Oh, this is dark. Okay, see, we're learning together. Beyond renovating rooms, the developer also plans a rooftop pool, gym, and lounge. If you already know some background on Hotel Cecil like I do, you know that the idea of there being a rooftop pool is, it's just, you know, it's just, I don't, mmm, mmm, it's just kind of eerie. I don't like that at all. We'll get into why. So construction is supposed to be done by 2021. I'm guessing with the pandemic, it's gonna get pushed back a bit. 
Although I think construction's booming in the pandemic in some regards, so maybe not. And it is now a historic cultural monument, but it doesn't take long to learn that Hotel Cecil has a very, very dark history. And I mean like really just, it's just, I took a glance at this page before starting this video to have an idea of like the scope of what we need to get into. And I'm just going to tell you, a lot of you probably think that I'm going to be covering the death of Elisa Lam and we will touch on it, but this hotel has dark ties to so much more than just her death, not to take anything away from that tragedy, but like this place is, it's just a lot. Let's get into some dark shit. Again, trigger warning, dark things. Okay. The first documented suicide at the Cecil was in 1931. A guest named W.K. Norton died in his room after taking poison capsules. What a way to go. Where does one get poison capsules? Who manufactures poison capsules? Anyway. Then in the 1940s and 50s, more suicides at the Cecil occurred. By 1960s, longtime residents had begun to call the Cecil, quote, the suicide. Not a name I would imagine any business owner wants their hotel to be called. In addition to suicides, the Cecil's history includes other kinds of violence and disturbing happenings. Wait, Wikipedia has a gem right here. I'm trying not to just read directly off it. I just want you to know our preliminary info so that once I start digging, you know, we have the framework. This says, in addition to suicides, the Cecil's history includes other kinds of violence and disturbing happenings. It also became a notorious rendezvous spot for adulterous couples, drug activity, and prostitution. I'm pretty sure every hotel in the history of ever is known for all of those things. Am I right? Like, I'm sure there's adulterous couples at the Holiday Inn, and I'm sure there's prostitution in every hotel, including, and maybe especially, the most ritzy ones. That's not special. One reason the Cecil Hotel is infamous is that it is rumored that it was one of the last places that the Black Dahlia was seen prior to her murder. Her name was Elizabeth Short. If you don't know the story of the Black Dahlia murder, I uh, welcome to Earth. We're not gonna cover that today, but it's one of LA's most notorious unsolved murders. Supposedly she was seen drinking at the bar days before the murder. Some theorize that she might have met the person who killed her at the bar in the Cecil, but that's entirely speculation. Another thing the Cecil is known for two, not one, count them, two serial killers were guests of the Cecil. One of whom is a very prolific serial killer, Richard Ramirez, who is the Night Stalker. It says that he stayed at the Cecil for a few months and that he may have engaged in part of his killing spree while staying there, which if true is, mm, I guess the other guests were safe because you're not gonna serial kill where you live. I don't know if they were always shared rooms, but imagine sharing a room with someone who turned out to be a serial killer. It would be scary. Another serial killer who stayed there, a little less known in the States, is Austrian serial killer Jack Unterweger. Unterweger? Unterweger. Unterweger? I don't know. I would feel bad for getting his name wrong, but he's a fucking serial killer, so. He stayed at the Cecil in 91. Oh, this says because he sought to maybe copy Ramirez's crimes. Like, it's one thing to be a serial killer. It is a whole other thing to be a copycat serial killer. That's like the lowest of the low. I just. Every time I start to get sassy, I gotta rein it in because my voice wants to go mm, and I need to go. Mm. Oh, oh no. Okay, but unlike Ramirez, where we think he might have done some of his killing spree while staying there, this says that Jack, we're just gonna call him Jack, the other one, while he was there, he strangled and killed three prostitutes. Why is it always the poor prostitute? Wait, pause. I just remembered prostitutes is no longer politically correct. I apologize, sex workers. I was reading it straight off of Wikipedia and I, and I just, my brain just I went on a whole rant about this in last year's ghost hunting, shame on me. Sex workers, he killed three sex workers, was convicted in Austria. Oh, and then he later hanged himself shortly after he was convicted. Great, congrats, Jack. You contributed so much to Earth. Thank you for that. You know, so the Cecil just seems to attract lots of evil people. Ooh, okay, there's a whole Wikipedia page for list of deaths and violence at the Cecil Hotel. 31, 32, 34, oh my God. Dark, so dark, I'm actually not even gonna read the details of some of these. You can look it up if you'd like, but yeah, you know, this is why it would be a weird place to stay, just because you know that so much suffering has happened here. In 37, a woman named Grace Magro fell from the ninth story window. Her fall was broken by telephone wires, which were wrapped around her body. She later died at a hospital. They never found out if it was accident or suicide. Like that's just unimaginable suffering. The hotel has a history of people jumping quite a bit. 38, Roy Thompson jumped from Cecil's top floor and was found on the skylight of a neighboring building. Ingesting poison, poison was like 
seemingly more popular back then in the day, another poison. In 1940, a teacher named Dorothy ingested poison while staying at the Cecil and then was reported to be near death and no further reports were published about her condition. How does no one know what happened to her? We must find Dorothy. Where's Dorothy? Someone's gotta know what happened to her. That was in 1940. So just right off the top, there are a ton of sites not long after the hotel opened. 31, 32, 34, 37, 38, 39, 40. And then they start to drop off. So that makes me think, well, one, why are there so many deaths in that initial period of the hotel opening? Why did they drop off? And then two, how prevalent are suicides and deaths in hotels in general? I'm guessing that it does happen probably more than we hear about because I would imagine some people maybe want to be somewhere not home for something like that, maybe to take the burden off of loved ones or just to be alone. I'm not really sure, but there's got to be a statistic on in general how often this happens. I can guarantee you that places like Vegas hotels see probably quite a lot of deaths that honestly might be comparable to a place like the Cecil Hotel, maybe for different reasons, but nonetheless, I don't think that deaths at a hotel are necessarily indicative of something particularly sinister happening. If you look at the dates where the suicides are very prevalent, it is over the years of the Great Depression, so that makes a lot of sense. And then it drops off and there's not as many. Let's see, the Great Depression took place mostly during the 1930s. There you go. It says 29 to 33. Oh, and then there was a recession 37 to 38. So people were probably feeling the effects of the depression for quite some time. Let me see. Average number of deaths per hotel. How often do people die in hotels? Sure. Ooh, a cracked article. Great. Very scientific. Let's do it. Six morbid facts about people dying in hotel rooms. Hotels are a magnet for suicides and unnatural deaths. It reminds me of when we ghost hunted to the Holiday Inn Express in Salt Lake City, Utah last year, which if you haven't watched that, go watch it. It was quite an experience and it's with Anthony. It's all fun and Spencer, he's okay. Spoiler alert, if you haven't watched it, we found blood on the ceiling of our hotel room like straight up on the drop down ceilings. And it was just on the metal pieces between tiles as though the tiles had been switched out, but the metal hadn't been cleaned off, which is also very strange. We didn't do a blood test or analysis on it, but we're, we're pretty sure that's what it was. And that led us into talking about how there are a surprising number of suicides in hotels and also people do drugs in hotels. It could be from someone like shooting up. I got my blood taken. It's a very pretty bruise, isn't it? Anyway, pretty much anywhere where people stay for extended periods of time, medical emergencies happen, people have heart attacks. It's probably like, if you watch my Denver International Airport video, go watch that. This video is just me plugging every other video I've ever made. We learned that pretty much every major airport has a morgue. A lot of commercial airlines are transporting dead bodies. It's just one of those things that's a lot more common than you'd think. I think about when I cracked my head open in a Vegas hotel we shall not name a year ago. If you haven't seen that video, go watch it. But I split my head open. There was blood all over the floor. And by the time I came back from the ER, they had cleaned up the blood. No questions asked. They could have been cleaning up a crime scene. And that's when I dug into Vegas. Ooh, I could do a whole armchair detective on that. That's when I found out that a lot of Vegas things, we'll just call them things, go unreported because Vegas doesn't want to hurt their tourism since that is the main bread and butter of their economy. All that to say, I'm not finding a figure just yet. Whoa, this is why hotel employees are always stumbling upon corpses. Okay, one second. I'm not saying that it's not unusual that the Cecil has had so many deaths, but so far, I think there's a lot of reason to believe that maybe that's not so unusual. I think what might be more interesting about the Cecil is the kinds of deaths that have occurred there or the kinds of people associated with the hotel, namely the serial killers, the very mysterious deaths like Elisa Lam, which we're gonna get into, the Black Dahlia having some connection to that. I think that's why this hotel has become infamous, not just for the deaths itself, but let's see if I can find it any more facts about the number of signs, etc., and deaths. You know, I think that the Lizzie Borden house is incredibly spooky because two people were murdered there and two people died in that house, but we've probably all stayed in hotels where far more people have died. It's just that you don't know the exact room and three by three foot square that someone had died. Whereas in Lizzie Borden, you do. If you haven't seen that, you should check out that video. <laughs> Look, if I'm only gonna upload a couple times this month because of whatever's going on with my body, I'm gonna remind you that I have a 
lot of really bomb content from years past and that they're still very good and rewatchable, evergreen, and that if you haven't seen any of them, you should really make sure you see them all. And if you haven't seen any in a while, they are great rewatches, truly. Like, I watch them on my sad days. TVH. I miss my friends. Except Spencer. You even had a woman die falling down the laundry chute. What? Yeah, I feel bad for employees that have ever had to deal with this. If you or anyone you know works in a hotel, please leave a comment down below and tell me your take on this. Is it something that you've heard stories about, experienced yourself, or have you luckily avoided it? Let me know. Hotels don't exactly want you to know about this stuff. I get why, but at the same time, it's like, look, if there's blood all over the floor of a hotel room, maybe don't clean it up. It could have been a crime scene. I'm just saying, it could have been a crime scene. I generally find a room is off market for about a week or so, and then it's fair game again. You know, perhaps for good reason. It's probably very bad for business in some ways, and in other ways, it does probably attract people. I bet a lot of people have actually stayed at the Cecil Hotel, just curious what the place was like. You know, we stayed at a Holiday Inn Express in Salt Lake City, Utah, like the most random place you could seek out and purposely go to. My stay was not to see Salt Lake City, it was to see that Holiday Inn Express. All because of one, one gruesome set of deaths that had happened there. So there's a lot of macabre people that I guess would want to visit places like that anyway. I say that with a look on my face like I'm not literally one of them. I don't even know why. Why do we want to go to these places, Peter? Good question. For the ghosts. For the ghosts. That's true. Well, then the question is, since there are probably people who have died in every single hotel ever, wouldn't that make every single hotel haunted? Yes, if ghosts are real. True. Well. A ghost at the Hawthorne Hotel turned on your phone and started recording a video without you touching it. If you haven't seen that video, go watch it. I was just about to say the same thing. <laughs> or if you don't like that hotel, fine. Watch the Queen Mary video. That's a hotel that floats on water. If you don't like that, fine. Check out the Monte Vista Hotel video. We stayed there two nights and there were also deaths there that the place is famous for. So I guess the only difference is that some become famous for these notorious murders or deaths that happen or they just get literally swept under the rug and they move on. Weird. Just think about that the next time you're in a hotel, which probably won't be soon for any of you because uh, we're still in a pandemic. Cheaper hotels aren't great about cleaning up. I don't know, like a Holiday Inn Express, you mean? <gasps> oh no. Okay, so someone who's planning on going to a hotel to themselves. Am I gonna get demonetized? Sorry if this is heavily bleeped. If it's not monetized, it doesn't get pushed to your subscription boxes as often. I want you guys to know that I uploaded in October since it might be a rare occurrence. But also the subscription box doesn't work, so make sure you hit the bell and then when you hit the bell, make sure you hit all notifications and then when you do that, make sure you go into your YouTube settings in your phone and allow all notifications. Anyway, apparently fancier hotels bill the deceased's family directly for cleanup and I, I guess less nice hotels just don't do so good cleanup. Oh, they'll just charge the deceased credit card. Oh, oh, wow, that's, mm. Even worse, sometimes somebody would get shot or stabbed in a bed and the mattress would be soaked with blood, but they'd be hired to just try to suck the blood out of the mattress itself. If that didn't work, they just cover the stains with a mattress pad and call it a day. Remember that time we were in the Salt Lake City Holiday Inn Express and not only did we find blood on the ceiling, but we found blood on the sheets the next day? Still 1000% convinced that that was Spencer bleeding in his sleep and he didn't know it, or he murdered someone because he's a serial killer. But regardless, it makes a lot of sense. I bet they left those sheets exactly how they were when we left them. Oh, there's ways to tell if someone has died in your room. Okay, let's see. Look for mismatched carpet or anywhere the carpet seems to have been replaced. Same thing with wallpaper and blinds. Oh good, sometimes replaced because of feces, but usually blood. Would you rather have poop <laughs> or blood? How excited are you guys to stay in a hotel after this? Can't wait? Am I just really selling you on the travel life right now? Oh god, I'm not even gonna read that one out loud, okay. Oh, actually, you know what? No, let's talk about this. Okay, there you go. For example, this article is talking about someone who was in a Las Vegas hotel. He noticed that a portion of the carpet had been replaced and then also noticed that someone had tried to clean a blood stain off of the ceiling. He tried to take this info and pictures to the hotel and then to police and there was no record of anything ever happening. Not even with police. Yikes. I feel like this has turned into a Las Vegas armchair detective, just like I was saying. Like in that case, someone in that Vegas hotel might have straight up cleaned up a side and not reported it. That can't be a thing, right? But then police would have a record of it. I don't know. I can't think about it right now. It's too dark. <laughs> the best the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police could come up with is that it wasn't a person who'd been murdered, but a can of ravioli or something. Uh, 
This person whose career was cleaning up blood for a living said that he would bet everything he owned that somebody died in that room. So that's just dark. How did we get here? Let's go back to the Cecil. A lot of jumping from the windows. This one's interesting. In 62, a woman named Pauline jumped from a ninth floor window after an argument with her estranged husband. He left the room and then I guess when she jumped, she had fallen on a pedestrian, killing them both. And initially, since there were no witnesses, police thought that they had killed themselves together. But because he had his hands in his pocket at the time of death and because he was still wearing shoes, they were able to piece together that he must have been just a pedestrian, truly at the wrong place at the wrong time. God, all right. There's a murder that happened in 64 to a woman that had been known around the building and was well liked and she would like feed birds in the area. And then a few hours after her murder, someone was walking through this bird area with blood-stained clothing. So case solved, right? No, they cleared him and it's still unsolved today. That's great. In 75, a still unidentified woman who was approximately 23 years old jumped from the 12th floor onto the Cecil's second floor roof. She had registered under the name Allison Lowell and was staying in room 327, which by the time the hotel is renovated, I doubt 327 is going to be 327 anymore and there's probably no way of knowing where that is. But that's interesting that they never identified her. If she's only 23 and it's in 75, you would think that she probably has dental records somewhere. I wanna know more about that, that's interesting. In 92, there was a perhaps suicide, perhaps murder. Can't tell if he jumped, fell, or was pushed. Whoa, this is another one. Actually, yeah, look at that. Back to back, 64, unsolved murder of the bird lady. 75, unidentified woman's death. 92, a man who might have jumped or was pushed or fell from a window was never identified. How do you never find out who they are? I mean, I guess they go to a hotel and they check into a name that's not theirs so that they can't be identified, but I don't really understand how no one ever figures out who that person is. How do you? The next death after that one wasn't until 2013, which brings us to the infamous case of Elisa Lam. Basically, Elisa Lam was a 21-year-old Canadian student who was staying at the Hotel Cecil for a few weeks and after guests reported complaints with the water tasting funny and being a darker color, they eventually found Elisa Lam's body in the water tanks on the rooftop of the hotel. So going back to earlier in this video, it's a little strange that they're putting a rooftop pool at the Cecil. When one of the hotel's most notorious murders involves a woman that was found in the water tanks on the rooftop of the hotel. This case is extra strange and went viral because there is footage from the hotel's elevator where she is acting very erratically, looking around as though there's someone she's afraid of. She reportedly had bipolar disorder, which could explain that she might have been having kind of a mental health episode, but also the buttons of the hotel's elevator are not working. The doors aren't closing even though she's pushing the buttons, which is very strange. And then the questions are obviously like, how did she end up naked and in a water tank that would be pretty hard? to get into that you wouldn't even necessarily know about unless you were part of the staff. Apparently the door leading up to the roof she wouldn't have had access to unless an employee opened the door for her or you could probably also assume that maybe she climbed up a fire escape onto the roof. But still, why, how, someone must have seen something that night. This says that uh, rumors persist that she died as a result of playing the elevator game, a paranormal urban legend that claims to take the player to another dimension. I mean, that's really stretching it. I'm still trying to believe in ghosts over here. So I don't know about an elevator game. And then that was unfortunately not the last death at the Hotel Cecil. The last one was in 2015. Cause of death was never determined. It might have been a jumper and the man is, it looks like not identified. So this says there have been at least 16 deaths at the Cecil resulting from non-natural causes, but 16 deaths over the course of, you know, almost a hundred years at this point is maybe not that bad. I'm still not finding a statistic on how common it is at hotels in general, but I remain skeptical that 16 is some kind of outrageous figure. I'm guessing it's sadly not. Let's talk a little bit more about Elisa Lam before we move on to other things. So one of the weirdest things about the Elisa Lam story is there are a lot of similarities to her death and this movie called Dark Water. The movie is about a girl who dies in an apartment's rooftop water tank. So already very eerily similar, but but wait, there's more. Then the story follows a woman and her child. The mother's name is Dahlia, which is very strange. If you recall that the black Dahlia is connected to the Hotel Cecil and therefore Elisa Lam. And the daughter in the movie's name is Cecilia. 
There are elevator shots from the movie that look eerily similar to the shots of Elisa Lam. In the movie, a child gains access to the rooftop through a door that is supposed to be locked. And if you recall, there's some confusion on how Elisa got up to the roof because the only door up there was supposed to be locked, alarmed, and took a lot of muscle to open. But perhaps it was a fire escape that she came up onto the roof. In the movie, the initial girl who drowns in the water tanks is wearing a red hoodie. So is Cecilia, the other young girl throughout the movie, and Elisa Lam in the surveillance footage from the hotel the night that she presumably died is wearing a red hoodie. And apparently even in the movie, this all starts because hotel guests started complaining about a funny taste of the hotel's water and poor water pressure. The same in Elisa Lam's case. Very, very, very strange. Dahlia has weird behavior and a hard time with the elevator in the movie, and we know Elisa does the same thing. Like, it's so strange that there are so many coincidences, but you're probably thinking that it just sounds like the writers of Dark Water were just morbidly inspired by the case of Elisa Lam. And I'd say that that sounds about right, except that Dark Water is originally a Japanese film from 2002, and there's an American remake in 2005, and Elisa Lam's death happened in 2013. So all the movie stuff happened first. And then it just so happens that Elisa Lam's death is so eerily similar to so many elements. It's like one of the weirdest things I've ever heard. Even weirder, there was apparently a tuberculosis outbreak around the same time that police were looking for Elisa Lam. First of all, a tuberculosis outbreak in 2013 is scary and very sad, but get this. This is so strange. It's like simulation type shit. And you know what? That's gotta be another armchair detective eventually. We're living in a simulation. It's proof, confirmed. And by the way, this outbreak of tuberculosis was in the downtown LA area, particularly Skid Row. And the test that they were using <laughs> to test for tuberculosis was known as the Lamb Elisa test. What? The test was made in 2009, obviously prior to her death because they didn't even know that she was dead yet. Very, very weird. By the way, I should mention that the official conclusion was that she had a manic episode and accidentally drowned. That is probably most likely what happened. There's still a lot of very weird things surrounding it and no matter what, it's very eerie and it's very sad. She had no drugs in her system at the time of death, but she apparently had a lot prescribed to her that I guess for whatever reason she wasn't taking. She had no alcohol or common illegal drugs in her system. She took one antidepressant that day, but it seems like that was it. But the toxicology report did not test for date rape drugs, and some people think that she was running from someone. And that's why she looks scared and she's checking around the corner of the elevator for someone. But it does seem like it might be a mental health thing too with the way that she's acting. Looking at her history of the things that she was on, it makes sense. Okay, so I'm looking more into the Austrian serial killer who stayed at the Cecil. He murdered 11 sex workers in Vienna, Prague, and LA, often by strangling them to death death with their own lingerie. Wow, that's a guy who really hated women. Oh, his first murder was in 1974, but he was released as a successfully re-socialized prisoner. Great, whoever made that call. <laughs> he was staying at the Cecil Hotel while he worked for an Austrian magazine writing stories about crime in LA. The irony. This website says he could use his status as a reporter to secure rides with the LAPD and drive around areas that would soon become crime scenes of his own. He was caught because he used the same kind of knot when he was strangling his victims and he ended up using that same knot when he hanged himself. One trick pony. Oh God, this is one I didn't read about or at least I don't know if I read about it. In 1944, a 19 year old woman who didn't know she was pregnant, woke up with stomach pains, and not wanting to wake up her 38-year-old partner, she went to the bathroom, delivered the baby by herself, and then thinking that her baby was dead. Oh god, I feel like, I know that we're here to talk about dark stuff, but it just it still feels weird as hit. She threw her baby out the window, and she was eventually found not guilty by reason of insanity. It's a fun video to do when I have such high anxiety. Whose idea was this? Oh, that's right, it was Mikey, pre-anxiety. So apparently the highest recorded level ever of suicides was during the era of the Great Depression. That makes a lot of sense why we're seeing so many in the hotel at that time. Because this is such a dark topic, I'm gonna leave some mental health resources and hotlines down in the description in case you need them. Yikes, here's a new thing I didn't know about. Okay, so in 1926, a 26-year-old named Jeffrey Thomas Paley purchased a rifle, climbed up onto the roof of the 
Cecil, fired 15 shots onto the street below. No one was hurt, but he apparently did it all because he wanted to be able to prove how easy it would be for someone, even a person with mental health issues, to purchase a firearm. Like, you don't need to fire into the public to show that you shouldn't be able to get a gun if you're mentally unstable. But you know what? It's 2020 and we still haven't learned that. He was talking about it in 1976. Apparently there was another killer at the hotel who was arrested while staying at the Cecil for likely murdering a woman who was found dead at the home that she shared with him. This place just attracts the worst of the worst. Ooh, paranormal activity. All right, this is something I don't know about. Apparently there's a video from 2014 where a boy captured a ghost, a ghost on camera. See, I can still work it into a Halloween series even if I'm not actually ghost hunting. Let's see this video. I'm very skeptical of ghosts caught on camera. I mean, it definitely looks weird, but I don't know what's going on here. You can't really make out what it is. It kind of looks like there's a body like going halfway through the window, but mm, two out of 10 ghost picture. Sorry, kid. If you want to see some real ghosts caught on camera, go watch my ghost hunting series from last year. <laughs> Seriously though, I'm gonna vouch for myself real quick. I don't pat myself on the back too often. Oh my God, everything's cracking. What did I do to myself? Anyway. I've never liked ghost hunting shows because I believe that a lot of them stage their stuff or they just completely fake it. I think that's prevalent on YouTube as well. I just want you guys to know that we didn't stage anything in the ghost hunting videos and every strange thing that happens, everything that I can't explain, which shockingly there were a few things that I truly could not explain. Are real and take that as you will. I'm not the super dramatic type to like really, really, really hype up a moment and be like, oh my God. Like I would say that I guess, cause it's mine and I know that it's real, but yeah, there's just some things that happened last year that I really still don't understand. And no one's given me an answer. So go back and watch my old videos and solve the mystery of the ghosts I might've caught on camera. Thanks. Oh, did you know? I knew this, but I forgot. Ryan Murphy of American Horror Story was inspired by the Cecil Hotel for the fifth season of American Horror Story, appropriately named Hotel. Fancy. I kind of want to stay here, but I also don't. Come on, give me some juice. I want some juice. I thought this one would be a good one to do together because I don't think that there's but so much I can look into with this unless we were gonna do a deep dive on Elisa Lam. I didn't want to focus on just that. I could never do something like this for the JonBenet video. And I promise you I'm using like the best sources possible for the JonBenet video too. Like actual crime scene, police report, toxicology type. And by the way, yes, that video is still coming. I just don't know when, but it is. You know what? It might not even happen in 2020. Get your expectations really low because I'm stressed and I needed to lower my own. Okay, search is related to the CISO Hotel. It's also coming up with 14th floor. What happened on the 14th floor? This is just a quick Google search that wasn't even for Elisa Lam and there are like diagrams trying to figure out how this woman died. So if you want to learn more about that, it's been dissected to death as far as everything that is out there and I'm not the one to be able to do it today. I'm sorry but this is still a very long video. Let's look at some reviews for the Cecil. 1100 Google reviews, three stars, two star hotel. Someone said they got bed bugs. It's pretty spooky. I still don't know how common it is for there to be deaths in hotels. Give me a number. On average, how many deaths in a hotel per year? Let's do it that way. Whoa. I don't know how legitimate this math is, so I'm just reporting what I'm reading. But there's a Reddit thread that tried to do the math. If deaths are evenly distributed, 13.6% of hotel rooms have had a guest die in them. So if you stay in a different hotel room every night for seven nights, the probability that you stay in a room in which someone has died is about 64%, according to Nigel LK on Reddit. So mm, people in the comments are saying that's wrong though. So I don't know, but it sounds really spooky. So let's go with that for now. But now I have a weird Google history, so that's great. So yeah, I feel like we've gotten plenty dark. What do you guys think? Do you think that these numbers seem kind of like what you would expect for a hotel that's been open almost 100 years? Do you think that it's cursed? Or is it just that the Cecil has not been so great at PR and we would see things very similar to this if more hotels were a little worse at covering up crimes and deaths? I don't know, but I know that I will probably never, ever, ever stay there, so. I guess I'll sleep easier tonight knowing that I, I don't have to sleep there. That's this week's video. Thank you guys for bearing with me and dealing with all this. I'm going to go drink some tea and probably not talk for three days. So if you like learning with me, let me know. When I know that I'm doing a simpler topic, I can present it this way. So you can kind of see my live reaction to learning things. And I'm kind of walking you through my thought process of how I go from one thing to another. Or if you like it, like the LRAD video or the Denver International Airport video, let me know that too. I'm open to trying all kinds of things. This is fun for me to do. So I just 
just want to do more of it. Happy October. Let me know in the comments down below what you plan on doing for Halloween. Whatever you do, please be safe. Also, let me know in the comments what kind of merch you want to see. I've been working on setting it up with a new manufacturer for a while and I'm getting down to some decision type moments, but I want to make sure that I'm also making stuff that you guys really want because that's what it's for. It's for you guys. So let me know in the comments if there's something in particular you want to see and that can be anything. Colors, types of garments, things that they say, pictures, whatever it is you really feel like you need, just tell me and I'll try to make it if a lot of people want it. That is it. I am so, so, so appreciative of you guys. I don't say it enough because I try to play it cool like... <laughs> But I'm not cool. So I just want to let you know. If no one's told you yet today, I love you. I appreciate you. Take care of yourself. Thank you for watching. I'll see you soon.